I embrace all the bad decisions I've ever made in my life. Like they make me, they make me, they make me who I am. This is Champagne is also a band podcast. One songwriter, one song. I'm Sven, your host for a journey into the music of Champagne Urbana. Recorded in a blue box studio with a songwriter from the Champagne Urbana music scene, past or present. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to be a part of the Champagne Showers podcast network. Welcome to Champagne is also a band podcast. Today, I have Sandman Slim. And you may know Sandman Slim from the group Trouble Chasin. Also, he was formerly known as Truth, a.k.a. Trouble. And he was formerly half of the duo Dizzy Ape and formerly part of the trio Ten Flow. Sandman Slim, welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing? Thank you. Today we're going to be listening to your song, The One, off of your recently released Beautiful Chaos EP. So without further ado, let's listen to the song. Yeah. The one hand up for the most high, then the middle finger up on both sides, and the whip feeling like it's gonna be a good day. Might hop up on the hood, let it ghost ride. My girl texting asking me what I'm on tonight. Her friend by, now that's something that we both like. Just drop the pin on the Addy and I'm gon' slide. Three way to start the day, this a goat life. Feeling like the shit now. Wolf of Wall Street all around me. You ain't talking money, nigga. You can sit down. Pop a little pill, it ain't for the thrill of it. I just feel a little soreness in my neck from this big crown. Used to sport a big frown. Nothing brought me up when I would get down. Getting over shit mad quick now. Ignoring bad energy that's fucking with my health. Fix my ego, then I found divinity within myself. Praise God, I arrived. Feeling like I'm resurrected. Watch me preaching for the ones who feel depressed and neglected by a system that's been driven. By the greedy and the wretched Recognizing life is more of a curse than a blessing Who expected to be satisfied with less Wait a second, went to school for plenty years But I never learned that lesson Teacher never even told me circumstance Your whole progression Rhetoric is really everything Moving on to better things I'm just trying to cool out with my lady My kiddos and all the squad Pop some bottles, eat some vicious spaghetti Like we the mob Put arena I would feel but familiar Don't ever cross You ain't made my sacrifices You never gonna be the boss Go to war to gain my peace I'ma take it at any cost Not trajectory is Give it to God Or whatever you are <laughs> Sing it with me One more time, one more time Sing it with me like this Jesus is the one <laughs> Welcome back So Slim, my first and favorite question to always ask is what came first, the music or the lyrics? For this one and for most of mine, the music came first. The producer, BMTJ, a guy out of Seoul, South Korea, he had a bunch of beats up on his page. I ended up going through, found a bunch that really stood out to me. But that's actually the one that like I heard it. And it's a sample I've heard before. I don't know if anybody's ever heard the Zach Fox song, that Jesus is the one, but I always loved that sample from the day one. Once I heard that and I heard how he flipped the beat differently, I was sold. Like everything I wrote for it just kind of poured out. I guess that brings to the point that this whole EP you used BMTJ as the producer, was their work so cohesive that you felt like that was necessary to use them for the whole project or did it just end up being that way? At the time that I started writing the project, we were maybe three or four months into lockdown. My head was all over the place, you know, as everybody else's probably was. And I ended up coming across one of his beats 
And the first beat I ended up coming across ended up being the song Six Feet on the EP. And after that, I was like, well, I love how this sounds. Like, it's got a familiar sound, but it still kind of sounds different. And as I went further through his catalog, I was like, it really doesn't sound like anything else I'm hearing right now. And naturally, when I hear stuff like that, I gravitate to that. After figuring out that his sound was just a little bit more unique, I was like, yeah, you know what? I've already compiled about four or five songs. Let me go ahead and just do this whole thing with him. I was curious about that because, you know, several albums that are produced are are usually you use multiple producers or and I don't mean mm-hmm. you specifically I just mean in hip hop there's this tendency to just use multiple producers to get the sound that you want for the overall album mm-hmm. there's a nice cohesiveness between all of them and you know it's funny that you said 6 feet I did I did a quick listen of all of the songs and just kind of listen to how it all fit in context how it leads up to it yeah yeah for an EP it definitely has like a plot line which is something you don't necessarily expect from an EP because EPs are usually no offense to anyone who does EPs exclusively but they have this feeling of not an afterthought but they, they have this feeling of it's like a here's, here's a small pack yeah here's a small pack of songs they're like a snack they're not they're not yeah, like yeah, a yeah. full meal and i feel like yours has this nice line from beginning to end and i feel like it has a cohesive story i wanted to jump into this song did you start off with what i think of as like the biggest boldest of a first verse is the throw one hand up for the most high then a middle finger up on both sides it just states that intention of where you're gonna go because i feel like this song has this whole you kind of go straight up the ramp and then all of a sudden you it's like this realization of where all of this put you and then you're like oh yeah but what's really important i'm glad you caught that i'm really glad you caught that was that your intention from the beginning did you start off with that line first yeah yeah, yeah. when i first heard the beat like just playing off the jesus is the one thing that popped in my mind and i was just kind of like you know it's one of those things it's like throw one hand up for the most high and it's like i'm grateful and then the middle finger up on both sides is like but don't forget, as grateful as I am to the creator, like, don't don't mess with me still. I feel like the whole lockdown itself kind of put me in that state of mind where it's just kind of like, I've really secured how I feel and how I look and how I think, like, about the world. And just going from that and kind of having this feeling of, like, being powerful. Like, I really can't be touched. Like, it was a, basically like a, that's kind of like a, a boast of confidence just to start the song off. It does feel like you're ramping up because you talk about there's this point at which it drops the bass just after you say this, the goat life. I say it kind of reflects off of like, it gives you a, like going right off into that next line. It's like that Wolf of Wall Street aura on me. You ain't talking money, nigga. You could sit down. And then that next line is like, pop a little pill. It ain't for the thrill of it. I just feel a little soreness in my neck from this big crown. That whole beginning is like kind of boosting myself up, especially coming off the song that it comes off of. Like the song prior is I am not okay, which is yeah. a complete like self-destruction. And it's like breaking myself and tearing myself apart. And then coming into the one and the one's like, you know what? I'm pretty great. I can't, re- I can't let myself get too far away from, you know, remembering that I'm someone worthy of, you know, being greater and becoming greater. And that's kind of where like my headspace was for the beginning of that. In some ways, this asks that question, what is being great? Exactly. I love that part. You just mentioned it, but I feel a little soreness in my neck from this big crown. And I think about, you know, all the things that one might say with royalty or with with those that might wear the crown is, you know, there's that line of heavy is the head that wears the crown, you know. Exactly what I played off of. And, And you mentioned it from the previous song, I am not okay. I love how it abruptly ends, but it's who the fuck is going to save me? And then it jumps right into Jesus is the one. Everyone I've told to like, listen to the project, I always try and tell them like, listen to every word because every word has a significance on the project. There's no words that are just in there to be there. They're there for a reason and everything leads into the next thing. Speaking of leading into the next thing, when you wrote these words and it, if it did start at the beginning, did you actually write, because this, this, Although there are definite sections because of the Mm. changes in the music and also changes in theme, it it is very much like a stream of consciousness and it's very much like from point A to point B, there's not really this delineation or you don't really go into a hook with this or or would Mm. you say you do? 
I, just in case I misinterpreted. It's more so of like trying to ride the energy of the track. Basically, I wrote all the way up to that soreness in my neck from this big crown. And I stopped writing that song for like two weeks and then came back two weeks later. I you know, thought about it a little bit more. I wrote some other songs on the project. And then as I finished everything else, I came back to finish that at the end. And that was why I came back in with like the, you know, used to sport a big frown. Nothing brought me up when I would get down, getting over shit mad quick now. Like that was me coming back in after processing what I've been writing about with the rest of the project, reflecting on the beginning of the song. And then it's kind of like, okay, I boasted myself up. Now let me tell you a little bit about how I got to this place. That's where you start making mentions of like, it's, it's fucking with your health. Yeah. You had to fix your ego and... Yeah. Then I found divinity within myself. And that's where like there's there's that guitar that comes in uh, mm-hmm. and it's just kind of um it's kind of the beautiful voice or the voice that like, it's like is uplifting. supporting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. uh that leads into like my favorite line in the whole piece is just like praise God I arrived, feeling like I'm resurrected. Watch me preaching for the ones who feel depressed and neglected by a system that's been driven by the greedy and the wretched, recognizing life is more of a curse than a blessing, still expected to be satisfied with less. At this point, you're you're ramping up, but in a different way, because you're reflecting Mm -hmm. on more of how you've been blessed, but also, you know, the burden that, you know, that crown has just changed a little bit, right? Like the the weight of the crown is more about realizing what you have to do to make yourself better or to look out for others or to be supportive of others. 100%. 100%. It's kind of like, that was like the piece that I was putting together right there. Like I said, I'm preaching for the ones who feel depressed and neglected by a system that's been driven by the greedy and the wretched, recognizing life is more of a curse than a blessing. And it's just one of those things where it's like, I'm understanding that there are people like me out there who have felt how I felt. Let me give you a little bit of reassurance. Like, I understand where your head is. Like, I love the line, life is more of a curse than a blessing. That may seem a little pessimistic, but in my eyes, that's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you're going to deal with bad stuff. And bad stuff is inevitable in life. But it is still a blessing. It is still a blessing that you are even here to be able to experience bad things. And that's kind of what I'm trying to get to with that part. Did you know this is the story arc that you wanted to create in The One like I said, I stopped writing this song halfway through right. and then I went and finished up everything else. And so when I came back to it, I was like, I know what I haven't said yet. Basically, right. it was like, I know, like I, well, I went into the project knowing everything that I wanted to say. I just had to get through all the things that I wanted to say. And so when I finally finished up everything else and came back, I was like, OK, let me squeeze in these last points that I wanted to make before I'm all done with this. When did you realize that you wanted this to be? the end point of the ep i did six feet first six feet was the first song i wrote then i wrote i believe i wrote stick up after that by the time i wrote vent i was like oh okay like Mm -hmm. with it starting like this i wanted it to start crazy and like kind of rattle you a bit and then that particular beat for the one was how it builds up and it keeps building it keeps building it keeps building it keeps building and then at the end it just kind of smooths right back out I was like, that has to be the last thing. That has to be the last thing that people hear. University Woes, where did that land in your writing process on this? I know this isn't Uh, about the EP, but... No, 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 no. That's fine. That's fine. That song came about earlier, you know, like maybe like midsummer. I did a stream with some of my friends, some of my buddies. I had taken a trip to North Carolina to go see a buddy of mine too, my best friend. He lives down there. And kind of going down memory lane and like, you know, what everything going on in the world, the whole pandemic, like not being able to really have that connection with, you know, the people that I I came up with in like my formative years, like just kind of reflecting on that. And I ended up writing that song somewhere between like going to see him and, you know, going to do the live stream with some of my buddies. And I was just kind of like, you know what, man, like that was a good time. But I talk about it. It's like, I'm happy about it. But also at the same time, there was a part of it where I was just kind of like, you know, like the, the very last line in that song, the days that we parted away, so sorry for the delay, stuck in nostalgia, missing the days. And it's just, that's my my nostalgic moment where I was just like, no, that was really good. I know I didn't do everything that I set out to do yet, but we still had great times. It's kind of the calmer after those first three events stick up in six feet. 
What is your favorite part of this whole song? Of the one, my favorite by far, and it's my favorite line on the entire project. Still expected to be satisfied with less. It was like realizing life is more of a curse than a blessing. Still expected to be satisfied with less. Wait a second. Went to school for plenty of years, but I never learned that lesson. Teacher never even told me circumstance could halt progression. Rhetoric is really everything. That's my favorite little pieces of bars and information on the entire project. Because it's one of those things that like, there's things that are so important later in life as an adult that they just do not prepare you for in school. They just do not. And they sugarcoat it. And they, they give a very minimalist, simplistic kind of explanation of what to expect later in life. I, I hate that. I hate that, that that's the rhetoric. Like the rhetoric should be like, hey, you're going to deal with some things. Understand that you're going to deal with some things. Understand that, you know, yeah, you can be whatever you want to be. You have to work to become that. But let's say if you want to become a stockbroker, let's just say, this is an example. You want to yeah. become a stockbroker later in life. That kid who's coming up in the richer family with more connections can get there before you. Even if you do all the same work, he can get there before you because of his circumstance. The line like circumstance can halt progression. Like the teachers don't tell you that. They don't explain that to you. They explain it to you on a very simplistic playing level. Everybody's got the same chance. Everybody's got the same shot. But the reality of the matter is not everybody has the same chances or shots. And so that's why I really loved about that song. And that's why I like the line after that is like moving on to better things. <laughs> it's like, okay, I brought you back down the, you know, I brought you back down the level. Okay. Now I've got you balanced out. Let me give you the rest. Yeah, I mean, isn't that also that's exactly why it's systematic racism, right? Like that 100%. it is because it's within the system to cover it up and not acknowledge it. And not or talk, talk about, about it. it. Yeah. I am you know, why this can be, you know, admittedly, you are indoctrinated with this idea that, you know, this is America, everybody has an equal chance. And, you know, until you have that forced into your face that you realize that is not always the case, even though it is yeah. not my experience, you know, yeah. that that does not mean that it does not exist. So anyway, exactly. sorry, that was my, my little... No, 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 no. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Why did you choose this as your favorite piece to talk about? I just like how complete it is. Like if I had to condense the whole project into one song, it is that song. So it's like, here's my bravado. Here's my, you know, my realism. And then here's that, what actually matters. I like how the beat changes up because the beat change ups allows me to really get into each piece and kind of have it come across the right way. Leading up to the, the Toad Arena line. Just talked about like circumstance can halt progression. Rhetoric is really everything moving on to better things. It's like, I just gave you all this bad stuff. But check it out. This is what actually matters. And this is what can keep me happy. And it's like, I just want to cool out with my lady, my kiddos, and all my squad. Pop some bottles, eat some fish and spaghetti like we the mob. Totorina, leader of the mob. I would kill for familia. Don't ever cross. You ain't made my sacrifices. You never going to be the boss. It's me kind of being like, I understand like how much I have to go through in order to get to where I want to get to. And that song is kind of like the culmination of that thought pattern. Like, I realize that this is not going to be an easy journey to get to where I want to be. I understand it. I'm ready and willing to face that challenge. If I keep these core values, then I know I can get there. That's why I love this song so much. Even how it ends, go to war to gain my peace. I love that line. I will go through this bad thing. I will deal with this just so I can get to that good place. And I understand how much that good place is a blessing. So I will do whatever it takes for me to get there while still protecting what is mine. Why did you name your EP Beautiful Chaos? I feel like a broken record sometimes, but like I've dealt with a lot of things in life. Don't speak on a lot of things, but those who know me, no. I've always looked at like chaos as like this thing that I've just always thrived in. It doesn't matter. I don't care what's going on. I'm going to figure this out. Rent's due tomorrow. I have $3. I'm going to figure out how to get this paid and I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to embrace the chaos. I'm always embracing the chaos. Just with everything going on in the world too. I made a point, I was talking to somebody the other day, but I made a point saying like, you know, my dad and I had a conversation where he was saying COVID leveled the playing field. You know what? You make a lot of sense. He was like, but also COVID is built for people like you and I. That's what he told me. He's like, it's built for people like you and I, because we are people who have been used to not having much and learning how to adapt to not having much and still succeed not having much. Now that most of the people don't have much, these are the moments where we can really thrive. 
Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of my, my looking at everything like, yeah, everything looks crazy, but moments like kind of bittersweet for me. This is where I can shine. This is my chance to really come through and really make my mark in what I'm trying to do. And that was like the beauty of the situation. So it's like me looking at, you know, the beautiful, the beautiful version of a horrible situation. Even in the midst of the current coronavirus pandemic, the Jubilee Cafe is continuing to serve packaged home cooked meals free to all every Monday evening, 5 to 6.30 p.m. Meals are available for pickup outside the 6th Street door to the Community United Church of Christ in Champaign, Illinois, 805 South 6th Street. Jubilee Cafe's mission remains the same. Feed hungry people by cooking healthy and delicious meals. We are open to anyone who cares to receive a meal. For information on the meal or how to volunteer, go to the Jubilee Cafe CUCC Facebook page or email us at jubilee.cafe at community-ucc.org. Welcome back. Sandman Slim, do you have a favorite venue in Champaign-Urbana? Canopy. Canopy is, I, I consider Canopy the home field. Like, that's my home field advantage. Like, anytime I do a show in there, it feels like I'm home. I've been in there a gang of times. I'm super comfortable. I know everybody on the crew. I know the bartenders. I know the light guys. I know the sound guys. I know the, the security, like... It's always felt like a family there. Did you have a favorite show that either you went to see or that you performed at? I did. Uh, I opened up for Bone Thugs and Harmony there. That was awesome. That crowd was huge. It was like one of the first times I performed in front of a crowd that big, especially in that building. Like having to win the crowd was awesome. A lot of adversities in life. Like I love challenges, though. And that was the one where, like, I came in. I remember I did my first song. They were kind of feeling me. By the time I finished it, they were like, okay, what's he, what's he going to do next? I did the next song. Saw a few more heads nodding. I was like, okay, we're going to get there. By the time I got to the third song, I happened to look. Went to the side of the stage, like, stage left or whatever. Yeah, stage left. I ended up seeing, like, one guy was, like, up on somebody's shoulders, and he's bouncing around, like vibing out to the music and i was just like yes okay we're there like we got it now that show was so fun from what i've heard and when i've talked to a bunch of different people the shows that people talk about that are their triumphs or the things that they're really proud of it's never when they're like the headliners and and don't get me wrong being a headliner would probably be absolutely amazing i can't speak from experience Mm -hmm. obviously but uh, but it's always when you know somebody was just like "Uh oh like i don't know about this crowd or this crowd doesn't know me and they're here to see somebody else. It's like, it's that winning. You have to win them over. Yeah. Um, which, which just, I don't know. Maybe it's not that counterintuitive, but in my brain, I'm just like, Oh, that just sounds, I mean, that sounds horrible sometimes, but I, I understand. It's difficult. It's difficult. Cause I mean, there's times where you just can't win them. Sometimes they're there to see who they came to see. Mm-hmm. And there's no possible way that you can win them over because they are headstrong on seeing who they came to see. I've seen people get up there in that same situation and kind of like shrink themselves after having that realization rather than like, oh no, let me make myself even bigger. Like, let me put my chest out a little bit more. Let me really get into this. Like I've seen some people shrink. I've shrank before, like in my early days, it doesn't serve you at all. So like, you know, one of the big things about performing is kind of getting over that, getting over that feeling of like, Oh man, I'm nervous. Like, oh man, I wonder how they're going to take it. It's like, no, go out there assuming that everyone's going to love you and then perform as if you're performing for a group of people who love you. How long have you been performing? Because you mentioned that you started off with 10 flow. How far back does that go? Uh, that goes back to 2008, 2008. Yeah. And, uh, that was back before I was ever doing any like actual show shows. We would, uh, That was me, my buddy Jimmy, and my buddy Brock that I went to college with down at SIUC. And uh, that was the first time I started recording music. I was 18, still trying to figure it all out. I knew I loved to do it because 
you know, I would skip class to just sit in my dorm room all day and record music. Like that's what I would do all day. We didn't ever do any official shows together, but we would go around to house parties it was back in the house party day. So we would pop around the house parties. Our main goal every night at a house party was like, we have to get a crowd around us at some point. We would go out to the house party, having fun, kicking it, having some drinks. And then we'd start rapping. So whatever was playing, we just start rapping. Like we would freestyle for hours and we would just get in a, get in a, get in a, a little group, start freestyling, kind of spread apart a little bit, freestyle a little bit louder. And so people started kind of huddling around and there were so many parties were like, next thing we knew, like we were the center of attention, literally. Like we'd have a circle of people all around us, like nodding their heads and cheering along. But yeah, that was like, that's how I got over stage fright. I got over stage fright before I got on stage and going down and doing music down there, like, and getting into those types of situations, it really helped me prepare for that stage life. Because when I went away to school, it was three hours away from home. I didn't know anybody. I knew not a single person. And so when I got down there, it was like, okay, I'm in a brand new situation. I have to learn how to win people over because the first time in my life that I'm not around people that I've known since I was five years old, that helped me out. You know, even now, like I can go do a show anywhere and be like, oh yeah, no, I'm cool. I've been in this situation before. This is how I present myself. Did you grow up here in Champaign-Urbana? Yes, yes, I grew up here. Have you always been kind of around the hip hop scene or is that more as you became a performer that you became part of the Champaign-Urbana hip hop scene? I became more involved and more in tune with the scene after, like I went away to school, I came back home. When I came back home, I started doing shows. I started doing shows around like 2009. Back when High Dive was High Dive, they used to have an open mic night there. And I would go up there and I went up there a couple of times. My buddies always tell me like, Bro, get up there, like, go do it, go do it. Nobody even knew I rapped. I had been writing rap since I was 13. Nobody knew I rapped until after I graduated from high school. I kept everything so secretive. And I don't know why still to this day, but like, it was one of those things like, if you knew me, you knew I could rap. If you didn't know me, like there was no way you knew I rapped. Coming back home from Southern, Getting a little bit, you know, more familiar with, you know, hopping on stage up there at High Dive. I started learning a little bit more about other rappers like Dre Bill. Before there was ever a Kodak Black, there was a kid that went by the name Kodak. And I remember him. I remember him very, very clearly because he was like the king of open mic at that point. Like every time he got on stage open mic, everybody in the crowd knew him. He had a gang of people on stage like his energy was crazy. And I remember just seeing him be like, okay, I can do that. Like I can figure out how to do that. And so like, that's kind of how I started getting a little bit more involved with the scene. And then I got really involved with the local scene after I had left for some years, I made a mixtape called the hate tape and hate was an acronym that was high above the enemy. I made that and that ended up getting the attention of some producers that I ended up working with for a few years in St. Louis. And they got me in some rooms that I never would have got in on my own. But I did that, learned a lot about the industry and about like performing and about making music. And then I came back here. And when I moved back here, that's when I really like got really, really into the local scene, started mingling with people and started like building some relationships with people. How did you meet up with Chase Scott and, create trouble chasing i started really doing shows around like 2010 2010 2011 my very first show i did i actually did at the illini union get this my very first show ever i made 1200 dollars. my very first show all right look that it sets your bar extremely too high to start off <laughs> basically so like <laughs> was was chasing that for forever but i got that because of a deal that my dad had struck with the illini union so I ended up basically getting like student body money for, to do my first show, my very first solo show. And so I did that first one. And then the next year, the opportunity came around again, same amount of money. I was like, you know what? At that time, I had heard more about Chase. I don't even think he and I had recorded our first song together yet. But I asked him to come open up that show. And so he came and opened it up. Killed it, of course. I've always enjoyed his music. And then... At some point, he reached out to me to hop on a song called Go Crazy. And it was on his, uh, I think it's called Champagne in a Movie mixtape. Love that song. Like he and I, like that's still to, our, to this day, one of our favorite songs that we've ever done together. It was the very first one. 
But we did that one. And then after that, for a while, it was just be like, I did my next project. I was like, I need a feature from you. He did his next one. He was like, I need a feature from you. And so we just, for a while, we just kept going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then back in 2015, I actually was going through some personal things and my ex and I were splitting up and it was kind of like an abrupt thing. And it was like, I need somewhere to stay. Like, I got to find a place to stay like ASAP. I got to figure this out. And he was living with two other guys. One of the guys at the same exact time had abruptly been like, I'm moving out. And so he and I had linked up. We were starting to make some songs together and we were kind of dabbling in the idea of creating a group. By the time that guy moved out, I was like, okay, well, let me get this room. And he was like, of course, moved in. And literally within me moving in, the first three weeks I lived there, we made Trouble Chasing One. My life consists of a lot of moments that just happened to fall into place at the right time. That was one of them. Yeah, so that's how that even came to be. Is there a reason that you decided that you would go from Truth, aka Trouble, to now Sandman Slim? Right before my 30th birthday, took a trip down to Naples, Florida. I was down there. It's kind of like, it's my first trip away from town in a while. I had been going through a bunch of things, but was finally like, life was starting to seem like it was starting to get a little more on the up than down. Growing up and like all through my 20s, it was just great moments down low, great moments down low, great moments down low. And it finally hit a point where it felt like it was kind of plateauing. And I was like, all right, you know, like this feels good. My mental space was a lot better. You know, I had changed up on doing a lot of things that I had been doing in life. You know, I came back from that trip and I was just kind of like rejuvenated. I was listening to some old music. And for the longest, all my Truth AK Trouble music, it was very, you know, like high energy, party, party, let's have fun mm. kind of stuff. I was approaching my 30th birthday. I was like, not really in this headspace anymore. Mm. Still know how to have my fun, but I'm a lot more responsible than I used to be. There's new things that I want to talk about, new subjects. There's new approaches I want to take to the music. You know, the Truth AK Trouble, like I had done that. I felt like, like, OK, that was that was a part of life that had been completed. 10 years of being that embodying that and people knowing that like that name was synonymous with like part. I was uh, doing a little bit of research and I was just kind of going through and I ended up coming across these uh, novels by an author named Robert Kadri or Kadri. I can't remember how you pronounce it, but Kadri, I think. And uh, he had this entire series of books based off of a character named Sandman Slim. One M of course, but basically this guy who was just like the most unlucky person, hmm. like the unluckiest person in the world, basically the self-proclaimed king of hell. Like he gets hmm. sent down to hell and just like he escapes out of hell. Basically, I looked at that and I was like, God, like I can relate. Like, you know, I dealt with so much crap in my life and just so much BS. And I was just like, man, here I am finally hitting this point where like I'm doing OK. I've made it out of that. You no, know, I just felt like the name fit perfectly. It was just like the name of somebody that just like, you know, went through hell, escaped it, but embraced it at the same time. And that's what I've always looked at myself as. Like, I embrace all the bad decisions I've ever made in my life. Like, they make me, they make me, they make me who I am. Yeah, that's why I landed on that name. It was so abrupt, too. Like, I, I still have friends that'll hit me up like, man, why'd you do that? Like, why'd you make that change? I, I grew up, man. Like, that's literally what it was. Like, in short, I grew up. And, you know, I, I, needed, I needed something different to present myself. I had no freaking idea that the hip hop scene, w I, I almost want to say that the hip hop scene is double whatever the rock and roll scene is, which is exactly the opposite of what I would have thought. And it and is it, massive. Every time I think like I'm getting a handle on how many, there's new artists just popping out. Even me being someone who's been like entrenched in the scene for like some time now, I'm finding like my little brother just started releasing music and putting out videos. He goes by Stove the CEO. I, like he just started putting out music and it's fire. He puts me on to like his other little friends who are all like making music too. And I'm like, man, this dude's, you know, this dude's dope. This dude's dope. This dude's dope. Like, okay. So like, you know, me being in my thirties now, like I'm looking back and I'm like, man, I forget that. Like we're in an age now where anybody could put out music. So like the kids who are fresh out of, you know, Central and Centennial or Urbana high school, like these kids are making music now and like putting out good music. And it's just like, it's crazy because the, the scene just keeps growing, keeps like it gets bigger and bigger. COVID-19 got you down. You're looking for some music 
some video games? Well, Exile Main Street still has all the things you need. New and used LPs, CDs, and video games. Exile Main Street still has something for any music enthusiast and old school gaming devotee. Exile Main Street is taking orders, making deliveries, and pickups by appointment. They can find just about any music or video game you need. Check out their website, ExileMainStreet.com, for links to their Discogs page for new additions. You can also contact them via Facebook Messenger to see what they can find for you. They can also be reached on Instagram, Twitter, email, or phone at 217-398-MAIN. That's 217-398-6246. Welcome back. So, Sandman Slim, what is your favorite non-musical thing? That's actually a tricky question for me, considering I spend... All of my days, literally listening to music and podcasts all day, every day. And then I get home at night and I spend some time with the kids, spend some time with my lady. She falls asleep. I'm right back to listening to music. Like that's literally what I do all day, every day. But God, my favorite non-musical thing, probably just being outside, man. Like I love just being outside. Like I'm a person who it could be a foot of snow on the ground, freezing out. I'll throw my coat on, two pairs of pants, some boots, some socks, and I'll stand outside with my headphones on just to be outside. Like, I just love nature. I'm a huge fan of nature. Uh, I like hanging out with my kids, man. I hang out with my kids. My kids are amazing. They're crazy. They're like three Tasmanian devils, but like turn into like cute, cuddly kittens when it's bedtime. Like, it's insane. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I love them to death. And I love spending time with them. And I, mean, I like being around family. I don't really get a chance to do much. Like, I'm a busy person. I'm a person who just never stops. And I get it from my dad. My dad hasn't stopped since I can remember. Those moments where I do finally get to, like, not be doing music or not be working in dad mode, not be in, you know, partner mode. Like, I like nothingness. Like, like people, I feel like people don't value nothing enough. Like, people who still are able to get bored. Like I don't get boredom. I don't get boredom at all. Like I've never allowed myself to get boredom. I love stillness. I love movies. I like writing, like not just music. Like I have plans to eventually like create a television show. Like I want to do a, a TV pilot. That's something I've always wanted to do. I would love to start writing, you know, some type of screenplay for a movie. Those are the things I like to do in my free time. Brainstorm video ideas and stuff like that. I spend a lot of time just thinking and processing and like creating makes me comfortable. The question is, if you like those moments of stillness, do you have that inclination? Like you have to earn the, the stillness for yourself? 100%, 100%. My girl gets annoyed with me often because like she notices that like I'm a person who's not like, I'm very rarely just satisfied. Like I'm just satisfied with this. Like I'm always like, no, I need more. Like, I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. I'm not doing this. I need to do this. I need to do this. And it just, it never stops. So like the moments where I do finally get my stillness, like when I just took this trip to North Carolina and I, like, I got down there, I've been busting my butt all year. I had finished up the music. I've been working six days a week for like the last year. I've just been constantly busy and constantly moving. So taking that trip, I was like, okay, I earned this week. I earned these five days of doing nothing of just enjoying myself. And it was one of those things where it's like, I love being able to enjoy the fruits of my labor. That's what I like to do. That's one of my favorite things to do. It's like, okay, I've worked this hard. I've amassed this much. Let me spoil myself and the people around me a little bit. Like, and that makes me feel good. Like that's the things I, that that's one big thing I love to do. Do you have a favorite forest preserve or nature area that you like to go to in this area? We spent a lot of time out at Kickapoo this summer. Kickapoo is real nice. I got to do some camping. I love camping. Love, love, love camping. Got to take the kids out there, hop on the river, you know, just, just really kind of enjoying being outside. Like I said, like if I can be outside, I feel great. If I have nothing to do and I got outside, like I'm phenomenal. Isn't it funny that the existence of this pandemic, this COVID, it's like the safe space is to be outside. Yeah. It's like that you know, to have that much openness and to be able to 
you know, experience, you know, what nature, like the pure, you know, that stillness again, right? Um, yeah. I, I think that's, it's like remarkable that I, I hope, I hope that even though this is a stressful time and it's difficult for people, like more people are connecting with that because I feel like that's something we human beings have kind of lost, you know, that I art of- I completely agree. The art of reconnecting with just the earth to, you yeah. know, and I, and I don't mean it in, in like a, well, maybe I do in a spiritual sense in a certain it way. Is, I, it is spiritual. I mean, like, you know, I don't want to ever like impose spirituality on anybody, but I feel like our personal relationships with nature and with this planet is a spiritual thing. Like everyone should have that, at least that level of spirituality to them to where they can connect with this planet and connect with the things that are out and around them. It's like, I'm a person who thinks deeply, but quickly I'll go out to kick a poo and like, I'll have this process of mind where it's just like, this is all here before me. It's going to be here after me. I'm going to appreciate it. I'm going to enjoy it. Like, and it's just nice to get away. Like I, like I'm, I'll use social media. I cannot stand social media. Mm. I hate being a, like, I hate being in the, in the loop. Like I, I enjoy not knowing things. Like yeah. I enjoy not knowing what's going on. Like outside of like the major news that I need to know, I don't care what Cardi did this week. I don't care what, you know, such and such said on clubhouse. I don't care what nobody said on Twitter. Like I like just being in my world and like the world that I've created, I enjoy. And it keeps me comfortable. It keeps me sane. Like that's what I really like to think about and kind of put my energy into. Sandman Slim, thank you so much for being on the show and talking about your song, The One, off of your new EP, The Beautiful Chaos EP. Hearing about your first gig at the Illini Union and how you became Sandman Slim and favorite non-musical thing like nature and being able to get out into the silence and giving yourself some quiet time. I really appreciate you taking the time to be able to Zoom with me. I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be able to kind of, I talk, and like I said, I'm not a big social media person. So like, I don't really give too much of myself to social media. I use it mainly to be like, hey, here's my music. Like, go check me out. So people don't really get a chance to like, kind of hear a little bit more about me and kind of get into my brain a little bit and how it works. So I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to do that. This is Sandman Slim reminding you that even in the midst of chaos, you can still find the beauty in the world. And great music is out there, so go find it where you live. Peace. have an NPR voice. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> studio, South Beaker, on the inside. Throw one up, uh, throw one hand up for the most high, then a minger. Uh, <laughs> I ruin lyrics, by the way. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm so it's sorry. Okay. It's but okay. I do. <laughs> so I might have to try this a couple times.